to order. We meet to probe the ever-deteriorating state of civil and political rights in Hong Kong on this, the eve of House passage of my bipartisan legislation, the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act of 2019, exactly two years ago tomorrow. We also meet the search in search of pursuing the most effective ways to mitigate and end the egregious crimes committed against Hong Kongers each and every day by the Chinese Communist Party. And we meet to remind the brave democracy activists that we deeply respect their courage and sacrifice and that they are absolutely not forgotten. Seventy years ago, I first introduced the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act of 2014. It was the time of the umbrella movement, which began in response to a decision by the Standing Committee of the PRC's National People's Congress to pre-screen candidates for Hong Kong's chief executive. In other words, the Chinese Communist Party was putting its thumb on the scale with greater force, and people were speaking out. Those were heady days with brave students like uh, Joshua Wong and Nathan Law emerging as the next generation of democracy leaders. When looking back, one sees courageous idealism, optimism, and enthusiasm that could bring about substantive political change. At that time, it was extraordinarily hard to get my congressional colleagues on both sides of the aisle, or the White House, to see the gathering threat, an existential threat, to Hong Kong democracy and human rights posed by General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping. Our bill only had five co-sponsors that year, despite a Herculean effort to get people to sign up, but it included now Speaker Nancy Pelosi. By way of contrast, in 2019, that bill uh, that passed the House had 47 bipartisan co-sponsors, including my friend and colleague Jim McGovern. In 2014, far too many people in Washington felt that Hong Kong, with its greater freedom and free trade principles, would somehow tug the People's Republic of China in a liberating direction. After all, Hong Kong had the basic law and many constitution that could serve as a model for greater respect for the rule of law in China one day. Such hopes proved illusionary, just as some American political and business leaders naively believed that delinking trade with human rights in 1994 would somehow help the Chinese Communist Party matriculate from a brutal dictatorship to a democracy. And in like manner, there were those who thought by, if, if China, there was ascension into the WTO, uh, they would practice the rule of law uh, more effectively. I had two hearings in this room in which we countered that argument that we've got to be careful that they don't change the WTO, uh, not the other way around. In March of 2019, as we all know, the Hong Kong government proposed extraditing alleged criminals to China, raising fears that political dissidents could be sent to mainland China to face charges over exercising their basic freedoms. Hong Kong's government and the police force began to very closely resemble that of mainland China in its response to legitimate protests, speech, and assembly. Congress, too, awakened to the changed situation and under the leadership of Speaker Pelosi, our Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act was put on the docket, was put on the House floor, and it passed. It went over to the Senate, and Marco Rubio led the effort there, got his bill passed, and it all became law. Indeed, that same day, Jim's bill, Jim McGovern's bill, placing restrictions on tear gas exports and crowd control technology to Hong Kong also passed, with me as the lead co-sponsor on that one. Congress spoke with a unified voice, and when the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act was enacted into law, the Trump administration gave it, gave it teeth, declaring that Hong Kong was no longer, quote, sufficiently autonomous, such as to warrant being treated as independent of China for trade and technological export purposes. The Trump administration also sanctioned key individuals in the Hong Kong government, including Carrie Lam, the Hong Kong chief executive. 42 PRC, 42 PRC in Hong Kong, a government and police officials have been sanctioned pursuant to Trump's executive order 13936. More importantly, however, for in many ways Carrie Lam is just a figurehead and mouthpiece for the Beijing, the Trump administration sanctioned two individuals who are Xi Jinping's hatchet men, Chris Tang, the Secretary for Security and former head of the increasingly repressive Hong Kong police force, and John Lee, 
the former Secretary of Security and current Chief Secretary. Both these men, Chris Tang and John Lee, need to be better known throughout the world for the purposes of being held morally and legally accountable. They, more than anyone else, except for Xi Jinping himself, are responsible for the current demise of human rights in Hong Kong, for they have been willing, the willing, executioners of the Chinese Communist Party's draconian policy. But beyond the names of those who should be called to task, are those we must remember for their valiant defense of freedom. We should remember Jimmy Lai, the brave founder of Apple Daily. That beacon of free speech shut down by the government in June of this year, his assets frozen, and his computers confiscated by the police. Jimmy is now in jail, periodically brought to court in shackles, while the court has yet to set a hearing date. People may not know this, but Jimmy is a man of deep faith, a fellow Catholic, who easily could have fled to safety, like the roughly 90,000 citizens who have left Hong Kong between June of 2020 and June of 2021, because he was, is, or was a rich man. Yet Jimmy stayed in Hong Kong to stand with those who spoke for freedom. He has been stripped of his liberty, his home, traded for a jail cell, yet he stands unbroken, a testament to moral principle and defiance in the face of tyranny. One of our distinguished witnesses today, Samuel Chu, a naturalized American citizen for nearly 25 years, has been accused of violating the national security law, the draconian national security law, which severely punishes four types of activities, secession, subversion, terrorism, and collusion with foreign forces, all, as, as um, Samuel says, carrying a maximum sentence of life in prison. Mr. Chu states in his testimony today that the Quote, the absence of the People's Liberation Army in rolling tanks like Tiananmen or barbed wires and internment camps like those of Xinjiang does not mean that the crackdown has been any less brutal, swift, and complete. Close quote. Of course, there are so many others that we need to remember, less famous than Jimmy Lai and others, but they are equally heroic. Over 150 have been arrested under the national security law, and maybe more, implemented last year, and countless others have been chilled from expressing their opinion. We have seen former legislators like Claudia Mo, uh, whom our witness Joanna Chu has highlighted in her testimony, denied bail while standing trial for practicing democracy. There are journalists who are now in jail for practicing free speech. Indeed, Hong Kong reportedly has more journalists in jail per capita than any other place on earth. We cannot forget them either, and we should say their names. Edmund Van Yeo Sing, Ryan Law, Cheong Kim Hung, Chan Pu Man, Lam Mang Chung, Fung Wei Kong, Yun Che Ni, and Gwyneth Ho are all in jail, and so many others. So many others. For those journalists watching today, hearing, or in attendance, I ask you to share their names, for freedom of the press is such an important right undergirding so many of our other freedoms. We cannot forget these people. We cannot forget these heroic individuals. We cannot forget Hong Kong. And I sometimes believe, and I've been in Congress now 41 years, that with the crush of business and, and global catastrophes and challenges, COVID, somehow Hong Kong can get squeezed out of our focus. And that today has to change. We have to pivot back to standing in solidarity with the oppressed and not with the oppressor. The media in particular, again, I call on you to lift up your voices. We cannot let the tyranny of Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party stifle the flame of freedom that resides in the hearts and, and of the people of Hong Kong. I'd like to now yield, I believe he is on the line, uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Jim McGovern, co-chairman of the Lantos Commission. Jim. Well, thank you, good and good afternoon, everyone. I want to, I join uh, Co-Chair Smith in welcoming everyone to this uh, Tom Lantos uh, Human Rights Commission hearing on the state of civil and political rights in Hong Kong. And I want to thank uh, my colleague for his leadership on, on this issue. Um, uh, he has uh, been um, committed to human rights uh, in in, uh, in Hong Kong for as long as I have known, and um, and I think we all appreciate his leadership. Look, we approach this hearing in a mood of sadness. We have watched the Chinese central government tighten its grip on the free and open spirit of Hong Kong. 
we have witnessed authorities shutter institutions of democracy and free expression. We have seen our friends jailed to silence their voices while, while others have fled into exile to allow their voices to be heard. And it is these voices that uh, preserve hope and remind us that dis remind us that the distinctiveness of Hong Kong cannot be wiped away by fiat. Today, we welcome not just a status report, but recommendations for what policymakers in the United States and in other countries can do to address the erosion of human rights. In the last two years, Congress has passed the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, and the Protect Hong Kong Act, which I introduced. Pursuant to these authorities, the executive branch determined that Hong Kong is no longer sufficiently autonomous to warrant differential treatment and imposed sanctions on government officials complicit in undermining autonomy, democracy, and rights. What more can we do to try to change behavior? Can we move to revoke Hong Kong's distinct WTO status as its own customs territory? Um, can we leverage the spotlight of the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics? The Congressional Executive Commission on China, which I also co-chair and Congressman Smith also is a member of, asked the International Olympics Committee to postpone and relocate the games if the host Chinese government did not let up on the Uyghurs and Hong Kong. They refused. We asked the Olympic corporate sponsors to use their leverage to demand improvements and respect for human rights. They refused. We owe it to Hong Kongers and Uyghurs not to dignify the corrupt stain that is in the Beijing Olympics. I urge the Biden administration not to send U.S. officials and American sponsors, not to send their CEOs. In December, the White House will convene the Summit for Democracy. I urge the Biden administration to use this event to shine a light on Hong Kong. The democratic freedoms that the people of Hong Kong aspire to and that the Chinese government is taking away are universal values. One practical thing we can do is provide humanitarian pathways for those fleeing the Chinese government's repression. The CECC will hold a hearing next Tuesday on proposed legislation, including the Hong Kong Safe Passage Act and the Hong Kong People's Freedom and Choice Act. And I welcome any thoughts our witnesses have on these bills. I wanted to say to the witnesses, I will be in and out. We have a rules committee meeting at 2.30, uh, unfortunately, uh, but um, I, I am eagerly um, uh, awaiting any recommendations that you have uh, on actions that we might take. But uh, I thank you and I thank the chair and I yield back. I thank you very much, Jim, for your comments. And it's really a pleasure and a, and a uh, honor to work side by side with you on these important issues. Uh, I'd like to now yield to Young Kim, a uh, member of the Foreign Affairs Committee and also the commission. While we await, uh, I would you now yield to Steve Cohen for any comments he might have. Steve, I, 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 thank I, you. I, I think I think Representative Kim just didn't unmute. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. Got it. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Perfectly. Thank you. Sorry about that. I, I wanted to thank both of our co-chairs, uh, Chairman Smith and uh, Chairman McGovern, for hosting this important hearing today to discuss the challenges facing civil and political rights in Hong Kong. You know, since the uh, the imposition of the national security law by the People's Republic of China in May 2020, protections for individual rights, the free press, and democratic institutions in Hong Kong have deteriorated very rapidly. This law and its vague and undefined language targeting secession, subversion, terrorism, and collusion with foreign entities has brought with it a shared sense of fear and self-censorship to the people and institutions of Hong Kong. Hong Kong police arrested 10 people under the NSL on the first day after implementation alone and charged six political activists with inciting secession and colluding with foreign forces by the end of the first month, including Samuel Chu, who is with us today. Since then, over 150 people have been arrested under the NSL and sentenced dozens of pro-democracy leaders to prison terms of six to 18 months for peacefully protesting. The press has also been silenced. 
with the Apple Daily forced to close its operations under pressure from the PRC and the New York Times moving its entire digital operation from Hong Kong to Seoul. Even long-standing institutions in Hong Kong, including LegCo, the education system, the judiciary, and even organized religion have not been exempt from PRC intimidation. While the extent of the authorities granted under the NSL remain vague, the intent is abundantly clear. The Chinese Communist Party has moved to violate binding international agreements and norms to cement its political control over Hong Kong and silence anyone, Chinese or foreign, who speak up in opposition. The United States Hong Kong Policy Act of 1992 is specific in its commitment to treating Hong Kong as a separate entity from mainland China, so long as it remains sufficiently autonomous. The PRC has violated the autonomous status of Hong Kong and its institutions by every conceivable measure, and the Trump administration rightfully ended its separate trade treatment in July of 2020. As a government and country, we cannot continue to turn a blind eye to what is happening to the people of Hong Kong. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of legislation that will strengthen our government's approach through the Hong Kong People's Freedom and Choice Act and provide a refugee for those fleeing through the Hong Kong Safe Harbor Act. We must be more proactive as Congress in enacting forward-looking legislation to ensure the situation in Hong Kong does not deteriorate further and provide tools to our government that allows us to build significant deterrence beyond sanctions that will force the PRC to think twice before violating Hong Kong status further or threatening our own citizens. I look forward to hearing testimony from our witnesses on how we can improve our posture on Hong Kong and the role of Congress in making this possible. And thank you so much for having me and I yield back. Thank you so very much, uh, Ms. Kim. Uh, I'd like to yield to Steve Cohen at this point. First of the Tom Lantos Commission to a president today. Uh, I'm saddened that we have to have this hearing, but I'm pleased to participate. Steve, we can't hear you. Hear me now? Now, yes. And we can see you as well, so please proceed. Okay. For having this hearing and for uh, the, the, your work over the years for human rights all over the globe. Uh, Tom Lantos was such a champion, and it's appropriate that a Tom Lantos commission meeting, we should be discussing Hong Kong as he would be, and standing up for Hong Kong and for freedom and for the rights of the people in Hong Kong that have been taken away. Uh, I visited Hong Kong in the late 80s. I only had one trip there. It was a delightful trip. It was vibrancy. It was freedom, freedom of expression, freedom of... Steve, we lost you again. Bad connection, perhaps? movement. It may be. Can you hear me now? Now we can, yes. Okay. The bottom line is, y'all have said the things I feel. I incorporate your statements by reference. I mourn the losses of freedom in Hong Kong, and I see that people have stood up as heroes. I admire them, and we need to do all we can to help open up our country to the people that want to leave Hong Kong and find freedom here, and we need to stand up to China for their repression of the Uyghurs and the Hong Kong citizenry. It's sad to see what we've, what's been going on, and the loss of freedom is, 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 is horrific. It's a precious thing, and we need to protect it. I yield back the balance of my time. Steve, thank you so very much. And as you know, we both have worked for years on the Commission on Security Cooperation in Europe. Uh, I've chaired it. You've chaired it. So it's great to have you here today joining in this effort. I'd like to now introduce Thanks. our very distinguished panel, um, three of whom are here in person. Uh, two will be uh, hooking up with a, uh, a virtual uh, connection. Uh, in order of their presentations, and again, I thank them. These are five people who are truly expert and have led for so long on these issues. 
So it's an honor to have you here. We look forward to your insights and your counsel as to how we should proceed uh, going forward. Professor Michael Davis is a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C., a senior research scholar at the Weatherhead East Asia Institute at Columbia University, and professor at law and international affairs at OP Jindal Global University in India. Long a public uh, intellectual in Hong Kong, he was a professor in the law facility at the University of Hong Kong until late 2016. His scholarship engages a range of issues relating to human rights, the rule of law, and constitutionalism in emerging states, with frequent publication in such public affairs journals as Foreign Affairs and the Journal of Democracy, as well as media commentary. Amnesty International and the Hong Kong FCC awarded him the 2014 Human Rights Press Award for his commentary in the South China Morning Post on two th in 2014 uh, on the Umbrella Movement. We'll then hear from Mark Clifford, who is president of the Committee for Freedom in Hong Kong and the author of the forthcoming book, Today, Hong Kong, Tomorrow, the World, What China's Crackdown Reveals About Its Plans to End Freedom Everywhere. He has also been editor-in-chief of the South China Morning Post, publisher and editor-in-chief of the Standard, and the Asia Regional Editor for Business Week. He co-authored with the WTO Director General, uh, Pamich Pakti, uh, China and the WTO, Changing China, Changing World Trade, published at the time of China's entry into the WTO. He's the author of The Greening of Asia, The Business Case for Solving Asia's Environmental Emergency. As executive director of the Hong Kong-based Asia Business Council, he co-authored Through the Eyes of Tiger Cubs, Views of Asia's Next Generations. Mr. Clifford's other books on Asia have examined Korea's economic development in, in the 1997-1998 financial crisis. We'll then hear from Joanna Chu, a senior journalist from the Toronto Star, Canada's largest newspaper, and the author of China's China Unbound, A New World Disorder. Doggedly reported and fiercely argued, according to Publishers Weekly, the book <clears throat> details China's rapid international rise and the ways Western nations have contributed to a state of global disorder. Uh, Ms. Chu has previously served as Bureau Chief of the Star Vancouver. As a global recognized authority on China, the author of China Unbound is a commentator for international broadcast media and was previously based for seven years in Beijing and in Hong Kong as a foreign correspondent, including for AFP, specializing in the coverage of Chinese politics, economy, and legal affairs for one of the world's biggest news operations. We will then hear from Pastor Roy Huying Chan, a Chan, I should say, who is currently the pastor of England Good Neighbor Church in London, UK. He was previously the pastor of Good Neighbor North District Church in Hong Kong. In 2019, Pastor Chan and his church launched the Protect Our Children campaign to mitigate tensions between police and protesters during the anti-extradition protests. Subsequently, in December of 2020, HSBC froze the bank accounts belonging to the church and that of Chan and his wife at the request of the Hong Kong police. Then we'll hear from Samuel Chu, who was the founder and managing director of Hong Kong Democracy Council and was very helpful as we were drafting the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, and I thank him for that and the many insights he provided in terms of content to that legislation. Uh, Hong Kong authorities issued arrest warrants against Samuel, as I mentioned earlier, in July of 2020, making him the first foreign citizen to be targeted under the national security law. In July of 2021, People's Republic of China Ministry of Foreign Affairs announced sanctions against HKDC, making it the first foreign entity to be targeted under the new anti-sanctions law. A first-generation immigrant from Hong Kong, Samuel is the son of the Reverend Chu Yi Ming, co-founder of Occupy Central, that led the Umbrella Movement in 2014. He is also a well-known friend of, the, of this commission and of the China Commission, the, uh, the Subcommittee on Foreign Affairs um, um, uh, uh, Human Rights Committee, which I've chaired, now I am the ranking member of. And he has earned, uh, served as a witness most recently at our hearing on the Beijing Genocide of Living. So Samuel, thank you as well uh, for uh, your leadership. I'd like to now uh, turn the uh, uh, recognize uh, Professor Michael Davis, and please proceed as you would like. Uh, <clears throat> thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I think uh, it's very important what's going on and to pay attention what's going on in Hong Kong. It's my custom when uh, c talking about this subject to, uh, to make the comment, you can't make this up. Uh, all the things that they've been doing in Hong Kong, uh, I couldn't write it in a novel. I don't know if I'm clever enough. Uh, I think one of the things that's very important here is the PRC, that this may represent a PRC template for overcoming liberal constitutional systems anywhere uh, when they try to exercise influence in governance. I think there are three key points that are worth making about the PRC's approach. One is that Chinese leaders are profoundly distrustful of liberal constitutional order. They've even made rules that professors can't teach it. Uh, and a second thing is that the CCP concept of national security is a whole society concept. National security risk, in their view, exists in almost any kind of behavior. Uh, and, and finally, that China is importing this concept to Hong Kong. And it is trying, by doing so, to replace the liberal constitutional order. Heard yesterday, and one of the speakers mentioned that basically the basic law is done, and the national security law has become the basic law of Hong Kong. So this is really important. And I think it's important to remember that the basic law itself uh, is a liberal constitutional document. There's no way of interpreting it otherwise. Now China wants to say, no, 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 you guys all misunderstood it. But it, you can't read it any other way. Promises a high degree of autonomy, maintenance of the common law, that human rights and basic freedoms, including the ICCPR, will be maintained, that the courts are independent and final. And these last two things are really important, that mainland laws would not apply in Hong Kong, except a limited number outside the scope of autonomy that might be introduced to Annex Three of the Basic Law. And two, that mainland officials would not interfere in local operations. Two major weaknesses in the Basic Law. One was that Beijing controlled, has absolute control over its interpretation, and it's used that to introduce a lot to Hong Kong. And the second is Beijing's foot dragging over democratic reform. So these things, I think, are important to know. If we look at the NSL, we can see that, in fact, what's happened is all these commitments have been abandoned. The national security law was jammed down the throats of Hong Kong. It overrides local laws. It overrides the basic law. Uh, it gives the National People's Congress Standing Committee the ultimate power of interpretation again. Uh, it's, it selects the judges that can hear national security cases and doesn't hesitate to badger. The officials don't hesitate to badger those who don't do what Beijing wants. Those selected judges can be removed if they make any statement that violates national security. Where do judges speak? They speak in court. In other words, if you rule against us, they can be removed. A committee for safeguarding national security is created with mainland Chinese advisors. So this already violates one of those guarantees. And, and this committee is not subject to judicial review. It can make and implement rules not subject to challenge. Uh, it's under the supervision of the central people's government, okay? And then there's an office for safeguarding national security that's made up entirely of mainland public security officials. And they can remove cases, as they threatened to do in the Jimmy Lai case, if the court didn't keep him in jail and deny him bail. They threatened to remove the case to the mainland and try him there. And you can only imagine how many rights would be protected. There's heavy pressure on judges. The crimes themselves are vague and can be interpreted any way you want, and it applies worldwide. So that's a quick summary of it. We know all the arrests, some of them have already been mentioned this morning. And in the first trial of Tong Ying Kit, this guy, youngster, who ran his motorcycle into a peace, a police cordon, uh, they did not mention human rights, even though they're charging him with incitement. You know, it's law school 101, I'm a law professor, that if you have incitement in a national security case, there's human rights implications. And even though the national security law in Article 4 says that human rights still apply and the ICCPR applies, the court did not even mention uh, this. Uh, there's, uh, we have to remember it's not just criminal prosecutions. 
The, the national security law, and I, I outline this in my written testimony, uh, provides for uh, the schools to be regulated, the media to be regulated, the bar and the law society have been put under enormous pressures, uh, and press freedom is under attack, okay? And this, is, they, this was not enough. Let's make it hard for any opposition to speak. Well, let's make sure they don't take up electoral office. So they amended the basic law in its annexes so that now there's a 1,500-member election committee that has more power than anything else in Hong Kong. Okay, so this is really important. Uh, the way they've stacked the deck is there's no way anybody else could get in there except a pro Beijing figure. And in fact, everyone else declined to run because you were going to be vetted. They set up a vetting committee to vet all candidates and they allow the, they instruct the police to investigate every candidate. In fact, recently, everybody had to declare the candidacy for the legislative council election, they call it, coming up, and nobody from the Democratic camp signed up. Because, well, you're gonna be investigated by the police and then by this uh, small committee that's made up of uh, Beijing stalwarts, and then by this election committee, you're not gonna clear it. And in fact, so far when they had oath-taking, they've weaponized oath-taking. You know, everyone since in Congress takes an oath, but you don't expect it to be used as a weapon against you to silence or to, to deny you office because of something you may have said uh, that they don't like. It's been weaponized, so this is really important. I think when it comes to solutions, and the time is limited, so I'll quickly run through them, I think individual sanctions have not worked so well so far. And I really think, and it's harder, but I think what the U.S. needs is we should not have international business practice by companies that operate in America outside the rule of international human rights. That companies, that we should have comprehensive approaches that incorporate human rights in what businesses have to do. And it's much more difficult to push back against that because that's American law. China has its laws. It regulates what its companies can do and defends it passionately. Well, we can regulate that our companies are adherent to human rights practices. Uh, I think we need to be more multilateral on it. A, a group of UN experts just the other day said there should be a UN review and that uh, this all should be looked at very carefully. And they condemn the idea that local uh, uh, organizations who are all now disbanding under uh, intense pressure, that they cannot have any foreign funding. Human rights is often subject to foreign funding. And then I wanna close with a kind of a personal comment. I'm a professor from Hong Kong. I spent over 30 years teaching students in Hong Kong. I have students in all sectors of the society. They're across the media. They're even in, were in the Apple Daily that, that my colleague here uh, worked for. Uh, and I worked at two universities, the Chinese University of Hong Kong first, and then eventually the University of Hong Kong. Even this week, these universities are ordering that statues be removed that commemorate human rights violations of the past. This saddens me deeply, but what saddens me more as a professor who teaches human rights and constitutionalism, I knew over all these years most of the people you mentioned that are in jail today. I know them personally. And the thing that's striking about them is these are the best kinds of citizens any country could want. These are good people. They're people not defending Hong Kong's rights, because they make money out of it, they're defending it on principle. And, and many of the students I have had who are now in jail stood up for human rights, stood up for basic economic welfare of the society, and spent all these years doing that because of principles. And I can say to anybody in Beijing and Hong Kong, when you're locking up the best and brightest in your society, then you have to look in the mirror. It's not them that's wrong, it's you. And I'll leave it at that, thank you. Um, thank you so very much, uh, Professor Davis. And you know, it's not just people, I know some of the people, I can't say I'm friends the way you are, I certainly have absolute respect for them, but you're speaking on behalf of your friends and that's very, very powerful. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, uh, President Mark Clifford, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you 
very much. Um, thank you, Chairman Smith, and I want to thank your co-chairman, McGovern, for your uh, extraordinary leadership on human rights worldwide, but especially in Hong Kong, where, where both of you, you and Chairman McGovern, have demonstrated leadership for so many years, uh, a deep and profound concern. And I'm sure I, I join many people in Hong Kong in, in thanking you for your efforts. And I think it's particularly important now when, uh, as uh, you alluded to before, the world does move on, and yet people are still in jail in Hong Kong. My friends, people I worked with, um, obviously people Professor Davis worked with. Um, uh, I was, uh, as you alluded to, a, uh, a, a non-executive director at Next Digital, which is the publisher of Apple Daily, the now shuttered pro-democracy newspaper. And uh, I, I, I second uh, all of Professor Davis's remarks. And I'd like to talk a little, a little more personally, a little more in a kind of micro way. Professor Davis has, uh, has sketched out the, the big picture from, sort of from 30,000 feet. I want to try to describe what it felt like to be at the sharp end of the stick as the Chinese government pummeled, destroyed uh, Apple Daily. Um, shortly after the national security law came into effect uh, last year, July 1st, um, police came to Jimmy Lai's house early one morning the, in August, the month after the law came into effect. They put him in handcuffs, which they'd never done before, and uh, took him to, to the headquarters of Apple Daily. And they perp marched him through the newsroom and took him off to, to the police station. They, they scooped up a couple of other people, uh, including some of those you mentioned, the CEO, uh, Chung Kim Hong, uh, the chief operating officer, Royston Chow, and uh, charged them on these very vague national security law uh, charges. Um, they were released on bail, although Jimmy Lai was put back in jail on December 3rd, and other than a brief hiatus with his family when he was under house arrest over Christmas, he's been in jail ever since. For what? For exercising the, the freedoms that are promised in this. This is the basic law that Professor Davis talked about. This has the seal of the People's Republic of China on it, and yet it's not even really worth the paper that it's printed on. It guarantees all these wonderful freedoms, as Professor Davis said. It's a very liberal constitutional document, and yet what we've seen is that these promises that the Chinese government solemnly made cannot be trusted. So let me talk a little more about what happened to Jimmy and the people at, at Apple Daily. Uh, there was a bit of a hiatus, and then in June, we had 500 armed police come into the newsroom, question journalists, uh, take uh, documents, computers. Um, in, in the end, they've ended up pretty much stripping the shelves bare. They, they questioned journalists about more than 100 different articles that had been written. Who wrote it? Who edited it? Who was involved with this? And. Uh, as if that weren't enough to create a climate of fear. It was pretty effective, as you can imagine. Um, they, uh, they took away, for good, as it turns out, it seems, uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Uh, Chung Kim Hong, the uh, chief executive officer, the current, or at that time, editor-in-chief, Ryan Law, and several other people. So we have seven people from the company now who are in jail awaiting trial on national security law charges. These trials are, are in many cases, some cases, a year or two off. They're just presumed guilt, guilty. I mean, they're not allowed out on bail. And as you've alluded to, Chairman, uh, about 100 or more people are also in jail for exercising their constitutional rights, rights that were promised in this document by the People's Republic of China. And it's, it's an unbelievable situation, which they piled onto by then freezing our bank accounts. It wasn't enough, because the journalists kept coming back to work. They kept putting out the newspapers. So um, three bank accounts of our three core companies were frozen. That meant we literally couldn't keep the lights on. China Light and Power wanted the electricity bill paid. We couldn't do it. Worse, we couldn't pay our journalists. We still owe 600 or so staff their June salaries. Couldn't pay it because the bank accounts are frozen. We had close to 600,000 subscribers for our digital service, probably the, around the highest digital penetration in, in the world. 600,000 people paying us every month in a city of 7.5 million people. Not bad. Couldn't take their payments. So we were essentially frozen out of business. To add insult to injury, the company was then taken to the labor tribunal by the government for not paying the salaries. So, you know, it's, you know as, as Professor Davis says, you, you really can't make this stuff up. It's, it's even Kafka, I think, would have a hard time, uh, or Lewis and Carroll with Alice in Wonderland. I mean, it's, it's quite insane. Uh, so 
Uh, we now have four different uh, investigations going against the company and against directors uh, personally. Um, again, trying to blame us for the fact that the company is out of business when they've put us out of business by uh, freezing assets and uh, essentially f throwing the, the senior leadership in jail. Meanwhile, Jimmy Lai, who you've alluded to, uh, I think one of the bravest people any of us have ever met, uh, languishes not only, well, I don't think he's languishing in jail, I think he's, he's quite, um, quite serene, if not, uh, he's certainly not happy to be there, but he understands why he's there, because he believes in, in freedom, and he is a man of deep faith, if, as you've indicated, Chairman Smith, uh, had his assets frozen as well. So he owns 71% of a company that used to be worth $100 million until the government essentially seized it. The government has prohibited him from using his shares, froze three overseas bank accounts, told the bankers, including bankers at Citibank, that if anybody touched those accounts, the bankers and anybody who did the touching would be subject to seven years in prison. This is pretty heavy duty stuff. So uh, I don't think uh, that anybody really wants to mess around with the Chinese government given the fact that essentially, as Professor Davis indicated, anyone who engages in any criticism is, uh, is effectively fair game as far as being locked up by the Chinese authorities. So they've succeeded in creating a climate of fear that uh, eventually drove our top management away even after we had closed the newspaper, which we did in late June. Um, I should say we went out, uh, I think, very proudly. The journalists can all be proud. We printed a million copies, more than 10 times our normal press run. We had thousands of people outside the headquarters at midnight as the presses were rolling, thousands of people in Mong Kok, Kowloon, throughout Hong Kong, snapping up the issues when at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. The issue was sold out. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that Apple Daily is, is now dead. Uh, here's a newspaper that existed for 26 years that I think reflected, given its popularity, uh, its evident popularity, it reflected the aspirations of the six of 10 Hong Kong people who always vote for pro-democracy candidates. Ever since there have been elections in 1991, roughly six out of 10 people support the pro-democracy camp, and they did it again in late 2019, after all the protests, after Beijing said there was a silent majority that was supporting law and order in the police, six out of 10 people voted for the pro-democracy candidates. Beijing can't tolerate that. They can't tolerate the expression of freedom. So you asked, I'll just uh, close by um, talking a little bit about recommendations. You asked about what we can do. I, I spent uh, most of my life uh, working for engagement between China and the rest of the world. I think China and the world are better off uh, when, when we work together. We've seen hundreds of millions of people come out of poverty in China. We've seen, you know, the, you know one of the greatest uh, up, uplifts in, in human economic history, I think. And yet, engagement isn't working. It hasn't worked the way that we thought. And uh, I think we now have to think about disengaging. And we have to think hard about what that policy would mean. The sanctions that you and others have put in place, I think, have certainly gotten people's attention. Uh, I would argue they could cut deeper. People like Carrie Lam and John Lee are protected by the Chinese state. People who are at private companies, for example, the, the special inspector that's investigating Next Digital is with a large accounting firm, an international accounting firm. He's working under the veneer for the Hong Kong government, but he's working under the veneer of a, of a respected international accounting firm. Um, Professor Davis mentioned the statue that's, that's under threat. It's, a, it's commemorating the Tiananmen killings at, at my alma mater, where I got my PhD, the University of Hong Kong. There's a U.S. law firm that's working with the university to try to remove that statue. Their U.S. investment in Hong Kong and in China is, is very important, not just for the amount of money it brings in, but also for the expertise and the know-how. I noticed that uh, Wall Street firms are, are just, the Chinese are playing Wall Street like a, like a, a fiddle or perhaps even a fine violin uh, because they know that Wall Street has access to the corridors of power here in Washington. But we can't, we can't uh, expect that business is going to make long-term strategic interests. I mean, we saw in the 1930s, Thomas Watson and IBM were happy to do the census for the Germans. Uh, we saw Ford Motor and General Motors happy to be with the expanding German economy in the 1930s. Do we want to look back, do any of us want to look back later on in our lives and say that we didn't do what we could to stop this, that we just let companies pursue short-term profit 
when, they, when we, we could have stopped it as a government. We can't expect the companies to act in anything other than their short-term interests. I also think that we should look at the, the actions and the activities of the Hong Kong government here in the United States. Hong Kong, by virtue of its special semi-autonomous status, has economic and trade offices that function as semi-consulates. Are those uh, appropriate to be uh, set up as they were before? Should they be registered or monitored in a different way? I don't know, but I think these are the you know, much tougher issues that are that cut much closer to the bone that, that we should all be looking at as we move forward. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you so very much uh, for <clears throat> that very insightful and that historical context that you also gave it. Uh, and Jimmy and I couldn't have a better friend than you, I w and others. I uh, would like to now yield to uh, Joanna Chu uh, for her testimony, virtually. Uh, hello. Thank you, co-chairs and commissioners, for this opportunity to speak with you today. I am here as a journalist to provide information, and unfortunately, I'm not in a position to offer policy recommendations for the commission to consider. I was born in Hong Kong. When I started working in Greater China a decade ago, I decided to renounce my Hong Kong citizenship. Even back then, I was worried about my safety because I knew Chinese authorities wouldn't recognize my Canadian citizenship if I were detained. It should be a Hong Kong-based journalist speaking to you today instead of me from Vancouver, but the sweeping national security law has sent a chill through the city I used to call home. Not only journalists, but virtually all professionals in Hong Kong operate in a cloud of fear and uncertainty. Psychologists, including high school counselors, are afraid to broach political topics, even during private counseling sessions. International engagement, including with the United Nations or foreign governments, as this commission knows, is criminalized as collusion with foreign forces. And while people of Chinese descent have always been the most vulnerable to Chinese state persecution, the national security law applies to anyone in the world. Hong Kong police have issued arrest warrants or have arrested American citizens. This makes it impossible for anyone to be certain of how to support civil society in Hong Kong without further endangering other people or even themselves. Chinese officials appear to be most concerned about support from Americans for Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement. Many experts have noted that past and present American politicians bear some responsibility for unnecessarily stoking tensions through irresponsibly non-factual rhetoric on China. <coughs> the research in my book, China and Bounds, shows how ordinary people like scientists and students usually suffer the most when U.S.-China relations degenerate. Needless anti-communist rhetoric only distracts from and can even discredit legitimate facts and findings about Beijing's human rights abuses. But today, I would like to focus on the question of whether any democracy could survive in Hong Kong. I've spent countless hours as a reporter navigating massive crowds of over a million protesters at times calling for voting rights. I've listened to the hopes and dreams of Hong Kongers from so many ages and backgrounds. Now it's unclear if large protests will ever happen in Hong Kong again. Most of the city's well-known pro-democracy leaders, including the old guard as well as youth like Joshua Wong, are in jail. Last month on September 8th, the National Security Department arrested four more members of the Hong Kong Alliance. This was a group that had organized the annual June 4th rally in memory of the Tiananmen Square massacre for decades. In January of this year, Hong Kong police also arrested dozens of Democrats, mostly politicians, for participating in an unofficial primary election. Now they are accused of taking part in a conspiracy to commit subversion. It was a democratic exercise. In July 2020, hundreds of thousands of Hong Kongers voted to narrow the field of potential pro-democracy candidates who were seeking seats in the city's legislature, which is semi-democratic. This was meant to avoid a splitting of votes to increase the chance of having pro-democratic lawmakers in office. 
But Hong Kong's security chief said the police operation was needed because the election organizers were seeking to paralyze the Hong Kong government by winning a majority in the legislature. So far, only 14 of the 47 defendants are released on bail awaiting trial. Those who remain in jail include Claudia Mo, a former journalist for international media, a student in Canada who has been a pro-democracy LegCo member since 2012. Hong Kong's High Court cited Mo's communications with foreign journalists on WhatsApp as a reason to deny her bail. Stephen Butler, the Committee to Protect Journalists Asia Program Coordinator, said this court decision marked yet another assault on basic freedom of expression in Hong Kong. The idea that a person's texts and interviews with mainstream international press outlets like the BBC, Wall Street Journal, is that it that is evidence of subversion is absurd and this will create severe obstacles for journalists in Hong Kong who are just reporting the news, he said. My research examines how Beijing's bid for control over Hong Kong is part of a wider picture. The same set of party and state agencies such as the United Front Work Department and the Ministry of State Security responsible for putting pressure on civil society groups and political entities in Hong Kong for decades has a similar mission all around the world, including in Canada and the US where we've seen a lot of pressure on people to self-censor and to stop criticizing China even when they're foreign citizens. In a conversation I had with Claudia Mo several years ago, she said to get a sense of what might be in store for other countries where China wants to suppress freedom of expression, international observers should pay close attention to what has happened in Hong Kong. When softer tactics, subtle pressure and economic inducements didn't work to win the hearts and minds of Hong Kongers, this gave way to widespread persecution and the use of new laws to steamroll civil rights. Meanwhile, Hong Kong elections have never been fully free, even though uh, the right to universal suffrage is enshrined in the basic law. But recent electoral reform rules will keep unpatriotic persons from gaining positions of power. A new vetting committee, which is convoluted because it's an additional layer of vetting on top of what has existed previously, will make it very easy to bar any candidate deemed as critical of Beijing. The remaining opposition politicians in Hong Kong who aren't in jail face a real lose-lose situation. Should they boycott the upcoming December elections in order to avoid lending legitimacy to the system, or should they run in the election anyways to hang on to any ability they have to represent the views of the majority of Hong Kongers who support democracy? Everyone I've spoken to in Hong Kong is feeling a sense of hopelessness. They worry that as authorities use increasingly complex legal methods to dismantle civil society piece by piece, one arrest after another, the world will stop understanding and stop caring about what is going on. I think the Commission is doing the right thing by hearing a range of expert and insider views on the state of civil and political rights in Hong Kong. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify. Thank you so very much for your testimony and for joining us, and I hope you can stay with us during, uh, as we go into the questioning phase. Um, I'd like to now uh, recognize Pastor Chen from the UK. Hello. Yes. Thank you for all of your invitation. Yeah. My name is Roy Chen, the former pastor of Good Neighbor North District Church in Hong Kong. During the social movement, that began in June 2019. Our church were committed to helping young people in need, such as setting up a Protect the Children volunteer team to provide human, humanitarian support at the demonstration site, providing employment and support, uh, food and psychological counseling to the needy. This is based on the Bible teachings. On December of 6, 2020, my church's charity account, as well as the personal accounts of me and my wife at HSBC were frozen. On the next day, the Hong Kong police prosecuted us 
for money laundering. They arrested the church accounting staff and resigned the director and also issued the a general order to me and my spouse. My church dis disbanded in May of this year with no money and danger of being blamed by NSL. And my wife and my family have been seriously affected since then. It is a pity that the Hong Kong government has acted similarly to the CCP using economic crimes to suppress the dissidents, anti-government people. Now we, we have to stay in the UK and at the, at, at, uh, we're doing a church named Good Neighbour Church England. We, we help to speak up for the groups and places that are suffering under the oppression of the CCP. As today, the religion freedom in Hong Kong is being suppressed severally. Quite a number of pastors who support human rights and freedoms are moving to the UK from Hong Kong due to the NSL. One of the story the former pastor, Remembrance of Grace Church pastor, Wing Xin Nung, has given us given speeches about the political situation in Hong Kong for a few years. After the impl implementation of NSL, he was notified after one gathering that he would be reported under the NSL. He has also been threatened a few times with people visiting his home. He had therefore decided to move to the UK in February this year to protect his family. Besides, the group Hong Kong Pastors Network has published the Hong Kong 2020 Gospel Declaration declaration supporting the fight for the justice. After NSL has come into effect, this declaration has been accused by the state-owned media Ta Kung, Ta Kung Pao that it is tax is against the NSL. Then Hong Kong Pastors Network has been disbanded in September of this in, in September this year. Not only my former church, Good Neighbor North District Church, but another church, El Calaisia, Hong Kong, which has been actively very active, play active, fighting for human rights and freedoms, was also disbanded disbanded in June this year. It is hence the second dis disbanded church under the effects of NSL. When it comes to NSL, church and individual would invite in would be have, have a great threat for the criminal liability and difficulties in getting resources allocated. This is what NSL affected affecting the Hong Kong religions and Christian. That's the, that's the, that is the end of my sharing. Thanks a lot. Thank you so very much, uh, Pastor Chan. And I'm so sorry for you and your congregation for the injury and the suffering you have endured. Um, but thank you for bearing witness to that, that truth here today. I'd like to now recognize uh, Samuel Chu uh, for his comments and testimony. Thank you, um, Mr. Smith, and, and thank you for uh, having been an unwavering ally and friend uh, to me personally, but also to the people of Hong Kong over the past uh, decade plus, and in your whole career here in Congress. And for Chairman McGovern and other commissioners who are listening, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, 
I want to second all the words and uh, points that have been made by my esteemed colleagues on this panel. I don't want to repeat what they have said. Uh, but as you noted, uh, might have noticed, uh, both Professor Davis and, and Mr. Clifford reference a statue that they are both very familiar with. The Pillar of Shame is a 26-foot high towering sculpture by Danish artist Jens Gauchert. It depicts 50 twisting and screaming anguish faces, faces and forms representing those who were cut down by the People's Liberation Army and the Chinese government in Tiananmen Square in 1989. The sculpture was first displayed publicly during the annual June 4th vigil organized by the Hong Kong Alliance in 1997, just before the handover. When it was first erected, the sculpture served not only as a public symbol, but also as a canary in the coal mine ahead of the handover on July 1st. Would there still be freedom of speech in Hong Kong? Will Hong Kong remain unchanged for 50 years as promised? And would Beijing really allow the ongoing public commemoration on Tiananmen after it has taken over? And so has stood the statue and the sculpture for the past 24 years on the grounds of the University of Hong Kong. Every single year, activists would gather to wash the sculpture by hand in a solemn ritual of remembrance. It is the last remaining public tenement memorial on Chinese soil. Last week, the University of Hong Kong sent a letter to the Hong Kong Alliance stating that the sculpture must be removed by yesterday, Wednesday, October 13, at 5 p.m. Hong Kong time, or it will be deemed abandoned and removed. Albert Ho, who was a former legislator, who is a former legislator, past chair of the Democratic Party, and the last serving chair of the Hong Kong Alliance, explained about the statue this way in 2018. Any attempt to move the pillar of shame would symbolize a complete stripping of the university's freedom of speech and expression. The pillar standing here symbolizes not only the fight for freedom and democracy, but an even more fundamental thing the freedom of expression. So I think no one will dare to challenge this core value. I hope the university understands that free thoughts, free speech, free expression, and free research are most important. If even these freedoms are gone, then the university should be closed down. If the sculpture is indeed removed in the coming days, Albert Ho would not have a chance even to see it himself as he's now serving as a political prisoner for exercising his freedom of assembly. And what Beijing has done in Hong Kong requires not only the police force and their apparatus of security forces, but also the consent and collaboration of private and international businesses. In the effort to remove the sculpture, as Mr. Clifford referred to, the president of the University of Hong Kong, uh, Professor Sun Ging, an American citizen hired Mayor Brown, an American law firm founded in Chicago, to carry out the task. Mayor Brown, spokesperson, said in a statement that we were merely asked to provide a special service on a real estate matter for a longtime client. Our legal advice is not intended as commentary on current or historical events. They join a long list of enablers of human rights atrocities in history, but they're certainly not the first or the last. Cafe Pacific, the Hong Kong airline, made headlines in 2019 when it fired employees for voicing their political views. Employees were called into interrogations where they were confronted with screenshots of their Facebook and Twitter and social media posting that were deemed to be sympathetic to the protest and then fired immediately on the spot. Four of the world's lar largest accounting firms, PwC, Deloitte, KPMG, and EY, issued a statement denouncing a full-page ad supporting the protests that were paid for by a group of their own employees. More troubling is when businesses like Mayor Brown and choose to are recruited into enforcing the law on behalf of the Hong Kong government. You heard the testimony of Pastor Roy, 
earlier about HSBC freezing his account, and that was his wife and his church. HSBC did the same to former pro-democracy legislator Ted Hui and his family, who's fled Hong Kong and is now living in exile. In May, Hong Kong police ordered Wigs.com, an Israeli web service, to take down a website linked to pro-Hong pro-democracy activists. And thousands of requests have been made by the authorities to tech companies, U.S. tech companies, for personal and private data on protesters. The absence of the People's Liberation Army and their tanks, like they were at Tiananmen Square, or the barbed wires and internment camps, like we see in Xinjiang, does not mean that the crackdown in Hong Kong has been any less brutal, swift, and complete. The tools are different, but the results have been the same. As Professor Davis mentioned, this week a group of UN human rights experts expressed concern about the arrest of another Hong Kong Alliance leader, Chao Hang Tong, on charges of incitement to subversion and being a quote unquote foreign agent. They warned, the expert did, terrorism and sedition charges are being improperly used to stifle the exercise of fundamental rights, which are protected under international law, including freedom of expression and opinion freedom of peaceful assembly, and the right to participate in public affairs. I urge the U.S. and this commission and this body and the members to respond powerfully and quickly to hold those responsible like Chris Tang and John Lee, as we've been mentioned, for depriving the civil human rights in Hong Kong with targeted sanctions and ongoing public condemnation. I strongly urge the commission and commissioners to adopt and highlight the plights of political prisoners of Jimmy Lai, Zhao Hangtong, Gwyneth Ho, and many others. And that commissioner demand U.S. and international businesses, like Mayor Brown, the law firm, who operates in the U.S. to answer for their complicity in the crackdown in Hong Kong and the mainland. So as we sit here today at this moment, the pillar of shame still stands at Hong Kong University. In fact, hundreds of Hong Kongers and journalists have been keeping watch over the statue around the clock since the news had broken that it was going to be removed. There might not be a more timely and apt metaphor to the current state of civil and political rights in Hong Kong than the fate of the pillar of shame. Its creation and unveiling in 1997 was a touchstone for freedom in Hong Kong. Its impending removal and destruction might as well be a tombstone for freedom in Hong Kong. I urge this body and its allies to stand with us and the people of Hong Kong and to continue to work to keep freedom alive. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you <clears throat> so very much, Mr. Chu, for that very eloquent and, and strong statement um, on behalf of those who are suffering in Hong Kong, including their basic human rights, the incarcerations that are just an abomination, all happening in the plain light of day, uh, although what happens behind closed doors is anyone's guess, and, and, and we know that mistreatment is, is certainly part of what the uh, Chinese police do. So I uh, thank you for that. I do have a few questions I'd like to ask our distinguished panelists. Um, you know, Mr. Clifford, you spoke about corporations. You all kind of referenced the, the problem of complicity with corporations. Um, uh, I do remember when, when Bill Clinton delinked human rights from trade on May 26, 1994. Um, I, along with some David Bonnier, a Democrat, Frank Wolf, a Republican, uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi, who was a member like me, just not in leadership yet. She wasn't in leadership. Uh, we all joined together and, and criticized that delinking in a very powerful way, saying, let's trade, let's have engagement, but let's make sure uh, that it is with conditions that respect the fundamental freedoms of, of people in uh, all of China, 
we didn't think Hong Kong was the problem that it has become, but Hong Kong could have been a great model of what they could evolve into. Uh, and he just delinked them completely on a Friday afternoon when nobody was here. Uh, I did a press conference. C-SPAN, who was here with us today, carried that press conference, uh, May 26, 1994. And I and others who spoke out then said, they've taken the measure of the United States and profits trumps human rights. Uh, and, and we have not gotten them back ever since. Uh, so hopefully we'll have an opportunity to make that right for our complicity as well. But the corporations, if you could speak further on that, you know, uh, uh, right where the three of you gentlemen are sitting, um, in February of 2006, I chaired a hearing with Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, and Cisco uh, about their surveillance state, uh, their complicity again with the Chinese Communist Party in coughing up names, personally identifiable information. In Yahoo's case, uh, a man named Xu Tao, uh, a human rights activist uh, uh, who, who sent a cable or an email, I should say, to New York about what you couldn't do uh, as Tiananmen Square remembrance rolled around. Uh, he got 10 years in prison. They went to Yahoo, and Yahoo said, sure, what do you want? Here, here, here's the list of names, all this personally identifiable information. And when I, after I swore them in, I said, why? And they said, we were just following orders, Chinese law. Uh, promulgated by the Chinese Communist Party. And Mr. Clifford, uh, you mentioned the IBM and, and, and the Nazis. Before that hearing, about two weeks before, I read a book called IBM and the Holocaust, uh, which was a powerful, heavily footnoted uh, book talking about how, how was it that the Gestapo always had very well written lists of where Jewish people were. Uh, it was because uh, IBM uh, had aided and abetted those atrocities being committed then, and that's what they're doing now when Google and others aid and abet that kind of, 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 of terrible misdeeds. Um, we got a call while the hearing was going on from IBM complaining that I was raising it. I said, you show me anywhere in that book that, where you can contest the veracity of that. So my point is the complicity of U.S. corporations, and you, uh, Mr. Chu, talked about uh, a couple of them, where uh, Meyer Brown, uh, a lawyer or with a law firm, just uh, uh, we were asked to provide a specific service uh, on real estate matter. <laughs> I mean, talk about a euphemism and a terrible, terrible, I mean, how does he look himself in the mirror? And then when you talked about the biggest accounting firms, uh, Deloitte and others, uh, and there are so many others that have been complicit. We had a hearing on the Olympics recently. I chaired one of them, and, and my friends and colleagues uh, on the, because I am ranking member on the China Commission as well, two great hearings. Uh, I kept asking Coca-Cola about, you know, they, 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 why aren't they speaking out? Why aren't they trying to get a different venue for the Olympics? And the answers were horrible, you know, because they don't want to lose market share. That's the bottom line. That is the bottom line. So could you talk about that? Secondly, uh, Pastor uh, Chan, and, or, and any of you who might want to speak to it, uh, in December of um, uh, 2018, I wrote an op-ed the, that the Washington Post published, and I called it the, um, uh, the World Needs to Stand Against China's War on Religion, and talked about the synodization of religion where everything, whether you're Muslim, Falun Gong, Christian, or Buddhist, name your belief system, it needed to comport with Xi Jinping's synodization plan where everything is as he wants it, again, with great deals of surveillance that goes along with it. Uh, it has only gotten worse, and now Pastor Chan and others in Hong Kong are experiencing what the mainland uh, and what the Uyghurs uh, with that genocide have experienced um, uh, for so long. We, I started off the op-ed with a woman who told how in Xinjiang, a Muslim woman, um, she was being tortured and she asked Allah to take her life. That's how broken she was. Uh, and she asked, why are you doing this to me? And the torturer said, because you're a Muslim and because you're a Uyghur. Um, there's just, I mean, and who ordered that? We all know from the New York Times and the investigative journalist report, uh, it was Xi Jinping himself who said, show no mercy. And I hope the world, this administration, administrations all over the world, in the free world, uh, realize uh, the monstrous acts and deeds that are being committed each and every day by Xi Jinping, uh, gen genocide as we meet. But again, on this um, religious freedom, and Pastor Chan might want to speak to it, or any of you, how do we get it so that uh, at least some semblance of religious freedom uh, is protected? Right now, um, it is 
it's the worst it has been since Mao Zedong, um, at least according to many of my uh, best uh, uh, people who provide information to us. And finally, uh, oh, if you could also speak to Facebook and Twitter. I'll never forget when my very modest number of, of Twitter followers exploded from a thousand or so to 26,000 uh, when the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act passed. And now I'm concerned that many of those people who wrote glowingly of Congress passing that legislation, it was my bill, uh, that passed in the House, um, that that becomes part of the, the uh, trail of evidence that is used against him. What is happening with Facebook and Twitter? And if you could, if I was President Biden sitting here, uh, what would you say to him? We know he's had conversations with Xi Jinping. Uh, we don't know what he has said. Um, we've been told in his February meeting that China, or Hong Kong, I should say, did come up. Uh, and that's good, but we'd love to know the details. Um, what would be your recommendation to him? Because it seems to me, honestly, we need much higher visibility. You know, you prioritize by what you really speak to uh, and are willing to put out for all to see. It's all done behind closed doors. Uh, Xi Jinping shakes his head, moves on, and continues uh, his atrocities. So what would you say to the president uh, as to what we should do? And maybe I'll start right here um, with the professor. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, uh, you know, I, there was testimony the other day from a Facebook whistleblower that essentially said that interest follows incentives. And we can say uh, behavior follows interest. Uh, and so China has been responding to sanctions by passing an anti-sanctions at law uh, and pushing back. And a lot of our actions have been unilateral, so we become easy targets. One of our, uh, Joanna Chu mentioned the United Front, uh, and they're very effective at targeting one country and rewarding another. So how do we create an incentive system that creates interest in our values. You know, it's interesting. We do that with corruption. We have RICO. We, we do that with finance in various ways. We have laws on that. We even do it with the environment. But the core value of the United States written into our Constitution in the blood of our people for centuries, we sit, as a professor, I have to say to my students, well, all these human rights treaties don't really have a lot of enforcement uh, available. Uh, basically, we do naming and shaming. Uh, so it, I think it is important, and I do not diminish the importance of having hearings and exposing naming and shaming. But it would be nice in this age when we see that we're facing a future of a kind, and it's, it's written a lot about now, authoritarianism, China being a sort of leader there, versus de democracies. And, and get people like Larry Diamond writing about, you know, how democracies are surviving or not surviving and, and this sort of war between them. So if this is our core value, can we build that into our laws, not just as a sanctions tool, which will, a, a unilateral act which will get equal uh, pushback, you know, Newton's law, but build, look more comprehensively at how human rights should be a part of our foreign policy, uh, not just as a kind of political statement, but how it affects business. So that companies, their lawyers, advise them that you shouldn't do this because you're violating the law and you can be held accountable. You can be held accountable either by lawsuit, by someone who's injured, or by uh, prosecution if it's a criminal matter. So I think a lot more work has to be done that makes this system of incentives, puts it in place. Ideally, it incentivizes people to behave, but when they don't, there should be some cost involved. That's how law works, right? So I think this is what we have to do more of because I find right now, a lot of what we're trying to do with Hong Kong, with uh, Xinjiang, with Tibet, and I've worked on Tibet issue as well for many years, is like shouting into the wind. Uh, and, and the Beijing regime, just simply ignores it and then mobilizes and, and, and wins friends somewhere else uh, to satisfy their business interest. So that's why the multilateral aspect has to be in the conversation. So when President Biden has his meetings over democracy, I think it should be more than, you know, three cheers for democracy, but should be looking carefully 
at what are the environmental conditions that incentivize the maintenance of democracy and defend it, uh, and defend people who call for democracy. How can our make, we make those human rights treaties and the Universal Declaration that we signed on my birthday in 1948, I wasn't born yet, but that, I'm, I'm born on December 10th. All my students know that. It's a sort of a meant to be a human rights professor. Uh, how can we make that real, I think, is a question we really haven't spent a lot of time on. And, and I think now we're confronting a serious challenge in this regard. And, and our own democracy right now is flawed. So some of this work begins at home. So this, this is kind of a, my sense of where we're at, and we can get into the weeds as we go along. Yeah. If, if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, well, thank you for, again for the work that you've done going back to the 1990s. I think um, the issue you mentioned of delinking human rights and trade was obviously, in retrospect, a mistake. And I. I think if, uh, if you were to provide uh, a little bit of friendly advice to President Biden, it might be that every time a U.S. official meets a Chinese counterpart, that the issue of human rights has to be front and center. Not just a box ticking, checklist kind of thing, but really there. The Chinese proudly told us how they gave us a list of 15 demands, I guess, when Wendy Sherman was in Tianjin. We should be giving them prisoner lists, too. And uh, we, need to, we need to raise the cost for the Chinese. They, they want our cooperation or, or on, on various matters, or they're not going to help us with, let's say, climate, for example. Well, is, Secretary, is John Kerry talking to them about human rights? He should be, because this is a fundamental core American value. We are not perfect by any means, but this is something the rest of the world looks to us for. We have work to do at home, yes but that shouldn't stop us from doing work abroad. So that's, that's the first thing, I think, uh, is to, is to re bring human rights back and make it a central part of U.S. foreign policy. I do agree with Professor Davis. Of course, we need to work more multilaterally. We're doing that, of course, with the Quad and other um, uh, issues um, uh, militarily. But let's, let's join with some of the, the democracies in Asia, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, there are a lot of vibrant societies uh, that uh, also have issues with China. So let's, let's try to bring them in. I do think, of course, that, that um, interests and, and incentives um, need to, to be aligned. And it needs to be in companies' interests to do the right thing. Uh, we have the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. That's cut down on corruption because companies can say, hey, I can't do that. I'm an American company. I don't want the U.S. DO Department of Justice going after me. Can we have something similar on human rights? I don't know. But we cannot count on companies to take a long-term view on these issues. It's very interesting that IBM was unhappy with you because they did pay a reputational cost for many, many decades. Uh, I think we're actually doing companies like HSBC and some of the other ones that have been alluded to a favor by not allowing them to do things that are stupid and things that are wrong and things that are immoral and things that violate international law. It's too easy to get along and go along with the local, the local boss who says, oh, we have to do this because uh, we want to do business in China. Oh, it was a longstanding client, so we want to help them with their real estate transaction. I mean, this sort of thing. But if it's backed up by law, then it makes it hard. It's easier for the companies to say, sorry, can't do that. Now, maybe some companies need to decide, do we want to be in China? Or do we don't want to be in America? Well, God bless them. Let them decide where they want to be. And, and maybe some of them will decide in China. I'm sure there are a lot of opportunities there. But I don't understand how companies that are going under the umbrella of the American legal system, the American constitutional system, should also be allowed to prosper by helping enable a, a, you know, a techno-fascist surveillance state. And that's really what we're talking about. And I think Mr. Chu very eloquently laid out the what's happened in Hong Kong using what I think we could call lawfare. You use a kind of veneer of legal and administrative procedures to accomplish a political end. It's not a legal system. Sure, it's not tanks, it's not concentration camps, but it gets the message across that you obey, you kneel to the emperor or else. So how do we uh, ensure that our companies aren't funneling more money, more know-how into, into China? I, I do think that we need to look at uh, 
at sanctions, just as we had divestment in South Africa. We need to look at the role of, let's say, index providers in essentially enabling U.S. pension money to go into to China. Do we want, do we want the, the retirement savings of, of firemen and teachers to be essentially funding and propping up the, the Chinese government? I'm not so sure that we do. Um, so uh, I guess I'll stop there, but I mean, I think there is a lot more we can do on the, on, on the sharp edge to, to counter the sharp edge of Chinese power. I think we have soft power, we have human rights, we have values, we have the great ideals that we fought for in this country for more than 200 years, but we have to back that up with some sharp power and not just sending in the, the, the tanks and the, and the Navy because we're into a different world now and I think we need to look at an asymmetric approach that does look at financial systems. So I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, I'll, um, I'll take a stab at and some of my observations. Um, I, I think it's really important to, uh, to take uh, a closer look at the financial institutions. Um, when we supported, and I uh, know you were a supporter of uh, the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, there were two parts to the reporting. There were individuals who were complicit in the suppression of human rights, and then there is the second report, but which financial institutions are to be listed and reported by the State and Treasury Department. We now have had multiple reports on the Hong Kong Autonomy Act. No financial institution has ever been listed uh, in that report. And, and I think that the authority exists and should be used uh, for uh, exactly this purpose. For every HSBC, you know, Pastor Chen and, and, and Ted Hoy's uh, example, there are many others that are not reported. Uh, you heard from uh, Mr. Clifford today about Jimmy's lies overseas account from multiple banks. Many of them operate, and almost all of them operates here in the U.S. The second point I think is important is that um, they know what they're doing. Um, Mayor Brown, the, uh, the law firm, uh, I, I will um, point to the letter that they sent. None of the attorneys who drafted the letter put their name on that letter, meaning that they know that if we put their name on it, that it becomes history in the public record. And that that's part of, I think, the bully puppet that this administration, this Congress, this commission, and individual members can continue to wheel uh, in support and in holding accountable those who are complicit. To your point about Facebook and Twitter, I recently uh, was uh, reading a story about uh, journalists and nonprofit NGOs, folks who left Afghanistan, who was fr fr frantically trying to delete past posts and tweets and pictures and, and others who contain information of folks who have helped Americans, NGOs, international human rights groups in Afghanistan as the Taliban was taking power. This is literally what is also happening in Hong Kong. And while we might not be able to change overnight the way in which that these tech company operates. These are, many of them, US tech companies. They are American companies. And if we are able to say to American companies that they're not to export weapon of mass destructions or other form of uh, technology, uh, why is it that they can export and share and make money off their technology in violations of human rights uh, elsewhere? And then finally, to touch on your point about religion, I think what we have seen and what we will continue to see is that the CCP and Beijing regime have a very strong proven tactic of equating any religious freedom as terrorism. And that's what you are seeing, not just in Xinjiang, but now in Hong Kong, where pastors and churches that are deemed sympathetic and even just showing up and having prayer vigils publicly are deemed as a threat to the state. And that's how we need to uh, call it out. That's, why we, that's how, what we need to label it, and that's what we need to do uh, to confront it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so very much. Uh, would uh, Joanna Chu, would you like to comment? Um, I would rather not comment on um, okay policy recommendations uh, just to, just for safety uh, reasons, but I, um, I would just recommend um, 
getting as much information from Hong Kongers as possible because of the risk of um, any actions being seen as foreign collusion or foreign interference. Um, I recommend <clears throat> that uh, the commission gets the latest news on Hong Kong from the Hong Kong Free Press, uh, which is, I think, the best English language news source at this moment because a lot of publications in Hong Kong are under a lot of pressure to self-censor or they're being shut down. Thank you. Uh, Pastor Chen? Yeah, um, I, I, I'm sorry my English is bad, but I may be, how to present is that not only Hong Kong people and also vegan, Tibet also suffer from CCP. On uh, yesterday, uh, one Swiss uh, company uh, selling the new weapons to the Hong Kong policemen, uh, some, some kinds of pepper spray uh, gun. That is new. I think that we need a solid action to stop CCP to, 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 to the, the attack or condemn the human rights. When CCP, no human rights, no religion freedom, we should, no trading, no Olympic games, no made in China product. When we still tr trading with CCP, still play Olympic games with them, still buy something which is made in China, these action were eating the bloody bread from who were oppressed by CCP. This is very famous sentence in the Hong Kong people. So I think that we should take a real and solid action now. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Chen. <clears throat> just, a, just a couple of final questions. And again, I want to thank you for your leadership over decades, um, all of our distinguished witnesses, and for being here today. It, it's most helpful, and, and we will do everything we can to follow up um, in a bipartisan way. And I think there's a lot of sincere concern uh, that we have not done enough, particularly of late. Um, uh, without objection, testimony uh, written and submitted by um, uh, Hong Kong Watch, Ben Rogers, uh, without objection, is made a part of the record. Uh, he makes a couple of points in his testimony. I would just ask you if you could respond. One of them that um, we haven't focused on, and that's the participation of foreign judges that he says is increasingly untenable. While none of them are likely to be called on to handle national security cases, their presence offers an increasingly corrupted legal system, a veneer of legitimacy. Uh, Professor, do you have any comments on that? There's, there's a, thank you for the question. There's one Australian judge that did pull out. Uh, there was pressure on UK judges to do so, and, and uh, they declined. They, th th it's a kind of catch-22 that on the one hand, they want to be there because of the very reason they were there, uh, but, and that arrangement was made, was that it was thought that having foreign judges would serve as a deterrent uh, for uh, local judges to give in to the pressure, because Hong Kong doesn't need more legal talent. It has plenty of that. Uh, it was really about uh, this deterrent effect. And so I think there's, uh, the U.S. has never been invited into this participation. It's only Commonwealth, even though we have common law. Uh, so this uh, has been the situation. And I don't think anyone has come to a conclusion uh, but it seems to me that the, the consensus, if there is one, is that if this gets any worse, and we're going to see with these trials, because right now the verdict is still out, there's a lot of suspicion with these uh, selection of judges, designated judges under the NSL, that those judges may be you know, co-opted and no, no longer independent, uh, and the accusations made against them may be uh, such that they give in to that. And if, if there's, there's, I think, a feeling that there's a line to cross, maybe we're waiting, you know, being uh, unduly optimistic that judges will hold their ground uh, because so far it's been almost impossible for them to do so. so. This is kind of the murky space that this is at right now. But I think, yeah, there should be a point uh, where I think people will start turning the other way. So far, that has not happened. Does this also apply to police officers as well? And Samuel, I think you wanted to comment too. 
Right, yeah, I, I think I wanted to add that I think uh, uh, Mr. Rogers, I think, brings up a good point, but uh, just another case just to illustrate, um, not only are foreign judges, um, they, and Mr. Davis can correct me if, if I got the facts wrong, that uh, one of the local judges, uh, magistrate, uh, Sam Shilman, um, who during some of the protest trials that he was presiding over had actually um, acquitted a number of protesters, citing that the police were giving unreliable testimonies in court. And he was blasted on the front page of the pro Beijing papers in Hong Kong, saying that this judge doesn't have any idea what he's doing. Uh, and, and here's a local judge who is well respected. Um, and after that so, uh, whole um, uh, event, uh, last week, uh, Judge Shum uh, announced that he's taking early retirement, that he's moving with his wife and his ch child to the UK um, immediately. And, and I think that the pattern of which that the judicial system has now been co-opted, I think it's clear. Um, to your point about, uh, there are definitely still many, uh, again, uh, I mentioned uh, not just uh, police officers who holds, uh, for example, UK uh, passports and citizenships. Um, there are institutions, as I mentioned, the president of the University of Hong Kong right now is an American citizen. Um, and I, I think that it warrants us to take a closer examination and review. And last point on the judiciary, I think that there are definitely a much more robust tracking needs to happen to the judicial independence in Hong Kong not just when the cases are um, in the front page of the newspaper, but how the courts, the personnel, uh, the documents, and the proceedings are being manipulated and hidden from public view. Uh, can I yes, add, that I think this last point is very important to, to track it, because it could be, I think a lot of judges in the past cherished their independence and valued the rule of law in Hong Kong. And, and it's important that they feel that they, they can guard that and that there's some kind of pressure going the other direction from that of complicity with the regime's agenda. So I think that's very important uh, because I think we're gonna see more resignations and so on of judges who don't buckle in, under this kind of pressure. But it's good that we uh, find a way to, to help them just like with corporate social responsibility to help companies not to misbehave by, by creating correct incentives. Yeah. Appreciate that. Um, I do have one final question. And again, it, it's been raised by Ben Rogers. So, um, safe harbor or safe haven laws, uh, he goes, and I, I, I think his point is well taken, it cannot be right that the US Congress continues to ignore the plight of Hong Kongers who are in desperate need of asylum. Um, what should we be doing on that issue? Should we be being much more welcoming in our law uh, for them? I, I think so. I think we should also open the door more widely. Uh, you know, there's always a big debate in this country about immigration, but we're all immigrants at the end of the day, pretty much, except for our native uh, brothers and sisters. So uh, I think it's important, and, and, and as an immigrant, in our immigration law, the policy generally has favored trying to attract talent. So Hong Kong is, is a hotbed of talent, so getting talent here. One of the things that Canadians have done I thought is, is quite instructive is that we know already that the president has said that people can stay longer who are Hong Kong studying in America. I think it, it would be worth doing is to open the door to Hong Kongers who have American degrees, period, uh, can have a, a path to uh, living in and working in America and gaining citizenship. So I think the, the first step was taken by the president, but I think there's more on that path, very specific things. So that, because one of the things, a lot of the suggestions we're making are not gonna have an immediate impact, but people right now need immediate help. So the immigration path is, is a very important one. Yes, thank you. I, I would um, second Professor Davis's remarks. I think uh, we should be as welcoming as we can be. There are many talented people in Hong Kong who'd, who'd like to stay. I mean, this is the big debate right now. Do you, do you go or do you stay? And I, I respect whatever an individual decides. But if someone um, wants to come to America, and particularly if they have an American degree, 
or again, borrowing a, a leaf out of the, the Canadian book, uh, perhaps a, more of a points-based system or some other qualifications, just so many people in Hong Kong have so much to give. And if they choose that they don't feel that they can give it in, in their native uh, land, then let's, let's welcome them into America and we'll be stronger for it. I'm, well, I'm, I'm sad because uh, we hate to see this brain drain out of Hong Kong. We hate to just sort of give the place over to the, to the mainlanders. But if there's no future and if, if you have children who are going to be forced to kowtow to, to Xi Jinping and, and his leadership, then why would you want your children raised, raised in, in, in Hong Kong? If you, you've, got, you've got little kids goose-stepping, I mean, it's just it's outrageous. And uh, I think, as, as Professor Davis said, we're a nation of immigrants. Sometimes we're more welcoming, sometimes less. But this is a, a moment when there is an immediate need, and we should be as welcoming and as generous as we possibly can be. Thank you. Mr. Chu. Uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to address this. I know I want to applaud the CECC uh, Commission for hosting and organizing next week's hearing specifically on this subject, and, and I'm glad that I get a chance to at least give some of my, my thoughts on this. Uh, as you know, uh, Chair, that this is personal to me. Um, my father helped ex uh, rescue the Tenement Square dissidents back in 89. Uh, the U.S. stepped up and provided humanitarian paroles back in 1989 and 1990. Almost 400 dissidents were rescued because of the operation called Operation Yellowbird that was started by the Hong Kong Alliance, which is now disbanded. I was sent away, actually, because of the fallout and the fear of retaliation here to the U.S. So I am an example of what that looks like if we welcome and when we welcome the activists and protesters in Hong Kong. I also want to say that Hong Kong is a unique situation. For example, unlike many of the refugee situation crisis we see, it is not the case that Hong Kongers are not waiting, at least by and large, at a third country at a refugee camp. They are still under the jurisdictions and the control and the monitoring surveillance of Hong Kong uh, if they were to be uh, undertaking a long refugee review process and then wait for that to come and be approved. Uh, the good thing about the refugee status, obviously, is that it comes with support, but it might not actually help those who are in immediate danger. As the chair and the commission, I think, knows that uh, I also worked at the State Department to provide uh, humanitarian paroles for a number of individuals, including those who fled to Taiwan via a speedboat uh, last year. We need to be using existing program, like the Significant Public Benefit Parole Program, that allows these individuals to leave as soon as possible. One of those applicants, and uh, without going into the details, um, in fact, when we tried to transfer it out of Hong Kong directly, was arrested at his first attempt in trying to cross custom at the airport. And so the need is urgent. I would also encourage that we continue to open up new avenues. The administration has already uh, implement or announce at least uh, a defer enforcement deportation order for Hong Kongers who are already here in the U.S. That provides a temporary 18 months protection for those who are facing uh, deportation uh, removal proceedings. More has to be done. We need to grant longer, more um, sustainable status to those who are here, just like we did after Tenement in 89. We should have a uh, similar uh, to TPS and other form of protection that goes beyond the DED uh, order. And we are still awaiting um, the Department of Homeland Security to actually announce the details of the DED program. Uh, it, we're now two months actually beyond the announcement of the program, but we have not seen any of the rules and the uh, implementation, we need to do that. And, and a, a nudge from the commission and from uh, the chair to Department of Homeland Security would be helpful. And finally, um, I think that uh, we have to really be careful about this pushback that we often hear, which is that if we let people in, the CCP is gonna send their spies. I wanna make it very clear again, as I've done many times, that the United States is an open, democratic society. And that we have a strong vetting process in which that refugee, asylum, or any other visa process have to go through. And 
on a different note, I think that the CCP has found other ways uh, to probably penetrate the U.S. than to actually use an asylum refugee program. But I think part of holding up our values and countering is not just about the retaliatory primitive move of sanctions, but to say that we're going to open up our door. We're not forcing anybody to do anything. If they come, then it shows that people are voting and deciding and determining for their own future and for their own family. So thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> thank you. I would just note parenthetically that we have on numerous occasions as a country opened our doors to those who had a well-founded fear of persecution, not just on an individual basis, but on a larger basis. The boat people come to mind. Uh, my first trip, uh, human rights trip, was to the Soviet Union on behalf of Soviet Jews back in 1982, uh, where we were providing that kind of assistance. And uh, parenthetically as well, um, one of my trips to Hong Kong, I went to High Island detention camp where there were a number of Vietnamese who were there that were at risk of being forcibly repatriated back. They were mostly people who fled Vietnam after the fall of Saigon. Uh, and we were able to turn around a decision uh, to send them back um, that was as they closed out the CPA, the Comprehensive Plan of Action. So uh, there's a great precedent for us. If ever there was a well-founded fear of persecution, it comes uh, with the boot of Xi Jinping. Uh, so if people want to come here, we should be welcoming them with open arms. Yes, Professor. Yeah, I should add that in Hong Kong, people are leaving. Yes. That, that's a very important part of this story. And, and the schools that we got reports now that some, I don't know, 80 or, I, don't, I forget the figure, of, several of these primary classes have been canceled because they, the students are leaving and going, sending, they're sending their children abroad. I raised my daughter in Hong Kong and she's just got friends everywhere. Uh, that are Hong Kongers who go abroad, and now they've gone. My daughter just finished Yale, and so they're they're here. They are they're in this country now because their parents recognized the risk their children faced, and uh, we need to recognize it too. Uh, may I add something? Oh, um, of course you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Yeah, um, I would just like to echo uh, Samuel's uh, concerns about suspicion towards. Uh, refugees and asylum seekers, but to add on to that, even people of Chinese or Hong Kong descent who have lived in North America for generations, uh, they tell me that they get their loyalties questioned all the time. Uh, myself, because of the way I look, because of my name, um, even though I cover human rights so often, um, people have frequently accused me of being a stooge for the Chinese Communist Party. Um, meanwhile, structurally in government, in think tanks, in you know, like policy advisory boards, there are often uh, in many Western countries, very few people of Chinese or Hong Kong or Macau descent. Um, and I think policy will be very uh, improved by listening to these people's voices because these are our lived experience. These are our families and places we grew up and our culture. So um, I think elevating these voices um, and addressing some of the racism and xenophobia that leads to people choosing to not speak up because they're worried about having their loyalties questioned. I think that's a key part um, and consideration um, that the commission should, should keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Would any of our panelists uh, want to make any final comment or recommendation before we close? If not, I want to thank you for your extraordinary, uh, incisive testimony, your leadership. Uh, it really does help the Congress to have people of your caliber, all five of you, providing the inputs, uh, particularly with some of the longstanding work that you have done uh, in Hong Kong. It's just extraordinary. So thank you. Uh, this hearing of the Lantos Commission is adjourned.